a good morning. Welcome uh, to the Genghis Weekly Investor Briefing. Uh, my name is Daniel Ogeto from the Marketing Department here at Genghis Capital. And uh, in this briefing, we go through uh, the week's expectation in uh, the different sectors in the, in the finance industry, that is the macroeconomics, uh, the fixed income, the equities, uh, the, the equity segment, uh, and uh, today we have uh, Melody Ndanu and Wesley Manambo taking us through. Uh, I hope that uh, you are set and ready for the presentations today. Uh, should you have any question, kindly uh, direct it to the to the Q and A section uh, down uh, below, so that uh, the questions can be handled at the end of the presentation. So I don't know who is starting today, uh, Melody, perhaps. Uh, hi, yes, uh, we're starting yes, yeah. today. Mm -hmm. uh, so just a moment, I share my screen. Okay, thank you. Let me actually do that. Yeah, okay, that's true. You can see the presentation? Yes, I, yes, you can. Okay. So uh, we'll start with the macroeconomic outlook. Um, so the National Treasury uh, published the draft 2021 budget review and outlook paper uh, last Friday before its finalization and its submission to the cabinet uh, tomorrow. So the comments on the draft are supposed to be uh, handed in today. So um, this report noted that there was a commendable revenue performance in uh, full year 2021 mostly bolstered by the tax measures that were introduced at the start of the year. Remember that there were some waivers that were given the previous uh, year. So the full year 2020-21 performance was the basis of the broad retention of the budget estimates for the current year. Uh, to be sure, the estimates, the full year 21-22 budget estimates is expected to increase by 30.8 billion, arising upwards mostly due to interest payments. So the National Treasury is expecting that the total revenue in the next uh, financial fiscal year to be at 2.4 trillion, mostly uh, comprising of ordinary revenue and appropriation in aid at 2.1 trillion and 263.7 billion respectively. So expenditure and net lending is expected at uh, 3.2 trillion, uh, composing of recurrent expenditure and uh, domestic uh, development and expenditure rather at 2.1 trillion and 675 uh, billion. So on the other hand, uh, disbursement to counties is expected at uh, 406.5 billion with the overall financing for the fi financial year 2022-23 um, expected to be lower at 775 billion, which is a fiscal deficit of 5%, 6% of the GDP. So, um, what the, the next metric that we're waiting for is the August inflation rate, um, which is supposed to come out on the 31st of August. And um, last, the last time, the, rather in June, it, July rather, it had gone up due to mainly increase in prices of commodities, in, uh, especially food and transport. So uh, the other metric that we are looking to, we're waiting for the result, the, publishing rather is the purchasers manager purchasing managers index which is going to be on the 3rd of uh, September so for the prior uh, period it was 50.6 uh, so for this metric usually a signal about 50 signals anything above 50 signals an improvement in the business conditions and anything below 50 shows a deterioration. So this figure has been falling for uh, two months now. It was 51 in June and 50.6 in July. So it's showing an just gradual improvement in the operation, operating conditions in Kenya. So mostly it's because the outputs and the new orders growth were weak uh, for that duration. And also because of the new taxes that were introduced during that period, it costs, uh, it pushed input costs higher. Uh, so going to the fixed income review. Uh, so the secondary market activity declined that 8.6% last week to 12.8 billion. So 
mostly we are of the opinion that because of the ongoing primary bond sale uh, that features the 21 year infrastructure bond it's the main reason for why there's such weak uh, turnover in the market so activity in the week was uh, spread out throughout the yield curve though the 20 year paper continues uh, recording interest uh, moving on to T bills, the yields have been edging upwards by about by about ten basis points across the board, and uh, the interest for the discounted securities, however, declined at the auction with a performance rate of thirty six point five percent, which was eight point eight billion. So as we move on onwards to the liquidity trends. Um, so the average interbank rates actually widened a bit by about 43 basis points week on week. And uh, the central bank has been continuing with the mop-up activities to try and uh, reduce, rather, the market is liquid. So they're trying to mop up the money that's in the, in the market. So they're doing this through term option deposits and uh, the current outstanding uh, bids that were accepted were 64 billion. Uh, with an weighted average of 54.5.422, sorry, with the bids uh, being received amounting to 67.75 billion. So looking at the net borrowing figures, um, including the overdraft, uh, the figure comes in at 161.9 billion, which is 24.6% of the 658.5 billion targets. Um, uh, moving on to the week's trade, uh, so we recommend a buy of the FXD1 2010-15 between 10.10 uh, .10 and 10.25 levels. So as you've seen, the market is still liquid as witnessed by the mop-up activities by the central bank via the term auction deposits. So secondary market interest in the infrastructure bonds is expected to to taper, like to slow down with the ongoing uh, September 21 year infrastructure bond primary sale. So uh, I'll let move it on to Wesley to take us through the equities market recap. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, good morning to you. The market was vibrant in the week as signaled by the uptick in the benchmark indices. The Nairobi All Share Index and the NSC20 rallied by 50 and 90 basis points, respectively, week on week. Uh, that said, the overall activity declined as reflected in the 48.4% week on week dip in turnover to 2.4 billion. On the top gainers, we had Samir, Kenjen, Kakuzi, Absa, and Centum. As we will see in a few, Absa reported an impressive interim performance that was reflected in the price. Kenjian, on the other hand, has sustained uh, growth in its top line, reporting an 8.7% year-on-year rise in its one in, in its one H21, the first half results for the year. And in addition to this, its capacity expansion initiative remain a strong top line driver, and its revenue diversification is really reassuring. The overwhelming risk, however, remains the single buyer risk, which has KPLC tied to its hip. On the other hand, we had Scan Group, IGADS, Standard, and Sassini topping the week's losers. We expect Scan Group's results tomorrow and hopefully some more color on the financial position and the investigation that led to the suspension of the senior management and the changes in the senior management too will be given. I should add that the counter's share price has been on a decline and it has touched new 52-week lows severally, mainly due to the uncertainty investors are exposed to. On the foreign, foreign participation, foreigners Foreigners extended their dominance, accounting for about 56.9% of the week's turnover. They sustained a bullish stance with a net inflow position of 557.7 million and accumulated on Safaricom, Equity, and Absa while exiting on EABL and KCB. The bows was, flood, was flooded with a mixed bag of interim results as 14 
counters released their first half results. The atmosphere was extensively that of improved performance with an optimistic outlook for the second half period. We'll come through as much of these results as time will allow. Uh, first, on Wednesday, Nation Media Group, TPS, Diamond Trust Bank, and BOC Kenya re released their, their half, first half results. NMG uh, reported an impressive recovery in, uh, in its earnings per share from a loss of one shillings and 90 cents to a profit of one shillings and 40 cents per share. The counter realized growth in its top line with turnover coming in at 3.7 billion. The key driver to this growth were advertisements done in print, digital and TV, and the subscription on the e-papers. Gross profits grew 22% year on year to 3.2 billion, and the profit after tax for the six month period and the 30th June 2021 was reported at 285.2 million after an income tax charge of 125 million and profits before tax that came in at 410 million. The counter's balance sheet grew 3.7% year on year to 12.3 billion and it closed the period on a sustained cash position of 3.6%, which was a 28.9% year on year rise. In NMG's results release, they reported that 16.8 million shares were bought back by the company as of last week Monday. This is roughly 19% shy of the 20.7 million shares that the ceiling in the buyback program. What's striking is the fact that the company accounts for about 98% of the volumes transacted since the buyback program began, which displays some sort of disposition effect by shareholders who seem to have purchased the counter at much higher prices and are not willing to dispose them uh, at the current uh, premium price of 25 shillings. The implicit indication of this is a likely dip in prices when the buyback program comes to an end but all we can do is wait and see. TPS Eastern Africa reported an 11.1% year-on-year decline in earnings per share from a loss of 3 shillings and 33 cents to a loss of 2 shillings and 96 cents. Revenues from contracts with customers fell 2.9% year-on-year to 1.1 billion with, with loss before income tax coming in at 692.2 million, which was a 20.1% year on year decline. Loss after taxation fell to 557.3 million on an income tax charge of 135 million. The company's balance sheet contracted 8.3% year on year to 14.2 million, in part due to a fall in retained earnings to 959 million, that's about 52% year on year decline. A key driver to this uh, subliminal performance was the impact of COVID-19 on global tourism, especially in the region. The management, however, maintains a positive outlook, outlook on the back of a gradual return to normalcy. Uh, what we should watch out for in the near term is how the rights issue that was approved by a, by a vote of 99.5% on the 28th June AGM, uh, how it will take shape. If it takes wing, it will see an addition of 200 million new ordinary shares, each with a power value of one shilling and, and ranking on equal footing with the existing issued shares. It will also, uh, it also goes without saying that this equity financing will boost the owners of Serena Hotels who may be facing a probable lower credit rating thus uh, a hit in acquiring some debt financing. Uh, BOC Kenya reported an impressive rise in earnings per share from 75 cents to 1 shilling and 96 cents for the six month period ended 30th June 2021. The counter registered a strong growth in its top line with revenues coming in at 696.2 million. The growth was attributed to an increase in COVID-19 medical oxygen volumes and medical gases infrastructure project coupled with a, a growth in demand from industrial gases. Earnings before finances, income and taxes came in at 500, came in at 54.5 million, sorry. 
while the net finance income declined by 13.8 percent year on year to 11.1 million. Uh, notably, there was a surge in incremental costs attributed to cushioning by the company of costs to make medical oxygen more viable. The company reported its profits for the period at 38.3 million after 27.4 million income tax expense on profits before tax that came in at 65.6 million. The company's balance sheet grew 12.9% year on year to 2.2 billion and it closed the period at a cash position of 613.3 million. That's about uh, 190% year on year increase. Also, the board declared an interim dividend of one shillings and 50 cents with a book closure on 24th September 2021. Bamburi Cement, which is a subsidiary of the Lafarge, released their results on Thursday. They reported earnings per share for the six month period ended 30th June at one shilling and 86 cents. That's a 1.1 year on year growth. The counter registered a 21% year-on-year growth in its top line with revenues coming in at 19.6 billion. This was driven by volume recovery in both the Kenyan and the Ugandan market and improved selling prices. The latter was on the backdrop of a higher uh, a proportion of sales coming from premium products. Total operating costs grew 15.6% year on year to 18.5 billion, and the operating profits for the period under review came in at 1.1 billion. The counter registered a 4.4% year on year growth in its balance sheet to 44.9 billion, and it closed the period at a cash position of 6.4 billion. That's about 102% year on year rise. The management maintains a positive outlook on the back of heavy government projects in Kenya and the oil and gas project in Uganda, which Hima Cement is projected to, to benefit from. Flametree reported a growth in earnings per share from 31 cents to 38 cents in the period under review. The counter registered a healthy top line growth with revenues coming in at 1.6 billion. Cost of sales rose 55% year on year to 1.1 billion, trans translating to a gross profit of 546.7 million. Notably, operating expenses grew 16.2% year on year to about 420 million, exactly 423.1 million, while finance costs grew by 80 basis points. They grew marginally to 59 million. Profit for the period under, under review was reported at 67 million, and the group's balance sheet grew 5.7% year on year to 2.6 billion. And it closed the period on a negative cash position driven by a significant rise in purchase of property, plant, and, equip and equipment. Now, a side note a negative cash flow position implies that the business has more outgoing cash than incoming cash. This, however, is not necessarily a sign of financial strain unless it becomes persistent and chronic. If the quick ratio and the debt to equity ratio are well poised, then the story conveyed by a seasonal negative cash position is either that of expansion or cyclical business cycles. Uh, Kenya Airways re reported an improvement in their loss per share from a loss of two shillings and 46 cents to a loss of one shilling and 97 cents per share. The improvement was driven by revenue and cost dynamics. And the counters total income for the period under review came in at 27.4 billion while operating expenses declined 10.4% 10, 10 year on year to 34.6 billion. This led to an operating loss of 7.3 billion. The comprehensive loss for the period declined 53.9% year on year to 9.7 billion on adjustments to gains realized from reclassification. Notably, the, the company's equity base shrunk 15.1% into the negative territory and its balance sheet shrunk 10.6% year on year to 153.3 billion. A negative equity position simply means that the company's liabilities outweighs its assets. 
in a deeper financial perspective, it implies that a company has incurred losses that are greater than the sum value of payments made to shareholders and accumulated earning over the, peri uh, over the previous periods. In closing, Nairobi Securities Exchange reported its earnings per share for the six month period ended 30th June at 29 cents. Looking at its top line revenues, declined 5.4% year on year to 276.5 million. This was attributed to a 16% drop in equity turnover during the period. Uh, interest income came in at 46.9 million. That's about a 27.6% year on year rise. And the total income for the period under review was reported at 366.2 million, reporting a marginal growth of 30 basis points year on year. And notably, administrative expenses rose by 9.6% to 258.8 million, while share share of profit of associates declined 95.7% year on year to 601,000. The counter reported profits after tax at 77.4 million and a tax, uh, after a tax adjustment sorry, of 30.6 million on the profits before tax that came in at 108 million. The company's balance sheet grew 5.7% year on year to 2.4 billion, and the board did not recommend an interim dividend. However, the management maintains a bullish outlook for the second half period. Uh, looking at the sub Saharan market performance, the Nairobi All Share Index outperformed its peers on a week on week median. The, market, the market's price to earnings ratio was above the African median multiple of 11.6, while its dividend yield was below the median by about 2%. Uh, in addition to Stanbix and BOC's interim dividend in our corporate calendar, Jubilee Holding declared an interim dividend of a shilling per share with a book closure of 10th September. We expect NCBA's results today and those of UAP are uh, and those of European BAT tomorrow. Also, uh, looking at the results that have come in this morning, we've had Crown Pins results. Uh, they have reported an improvement in their performance. Their balance sheet grew, they had a sustained growth in their top line, and there was no dividend recommendation. Also, Standard Group re re released their results, and they had uh, an impressive performance and uh, quite notable improvements. For homeboys also, I've seen the results and it was a little bit not so warm for a Monday morning. Uh, but we'll do some summaries and forward the same to you. With that said, I'll hand over to Melody. Uh, thank you, Wesley. So I'm going to have a look at the financial sector highlights. So looking at the banking sector, most of the counters closed higher than at the start of the week. Uh, APSA experienced the highest rise uh, in share price to 11 shillings. That's a 6.8% rise week on week to close at uh, close to its 52 week high of 11.15. And this is mostly due to the results that it, uh, it posted. For Stanchat also, it rose to 140 shillings per share. Uh, this is a 2.8% rise week on week, um, also mostly boosted by the results it uh, posted uh, last week. Equity as well has continued its rally, uh, closing at 54.25, uh, which is hitting, actually hitting its 52-week high. With KCB, uh, it went down marginally by 1.1% to 48.55. Uh, however, NCBA uh, NCBA's counter fell marginally by 1.9% to 26.45. So as uh, Wesley had mentioned earlier, we are just, uh, we've seen that the INDM and its NCBA results have come. So we'll have to do an analysis and go through it the next week. So for the insurance uh, counters, Liberty Kenya Holdings rose 4.6% week on week to close at 8.58, even though it posted uh, lower earnings during the week. For Jubilee, Sanlam, and Kenya Re, they were relatively flat. The, however, Britam and CIC edged lower by 0.7% to 8.12 and 2.75 uh, shillings, respectively. So, um, looking at uh, 
the news. Uh, we saw that KCB has completed its acquisition of Bank Popular de Rwanda. So it made this an announcement to its shareholders and its investing public on the 26th of August. And um, it was completed on the 25th of August. So now PPR's estimated market share in Rwanda is considered to be around 11%. And now when now the, both, the, the, both the entities are merged, the market share will go up to about 17%. So uh, it's this two, uh, the integration of these two entities is supposed to contribute about 81 billion to the balance sheet and generate about 2 billion uh, in profits. So they say that they also have another transaction, the one for Tanzania for Bank ABC. Uh, they had mentioned that it may be completed in quarter four of this financial year. So, um, uh, um, so these acquisitions basically are supposed to give us good springboard and momentum to increase the market share in the two markets for Rwanda and uh, Tanzania. So from this acquisition and integration, they expect that uh, there'll be synergies and cost efficiencies, as well as growth in um, interest income and revenue streams, because BPR is considered to be quite strong in the SME and retail uh, sector uh, in Rwanda with a very large uh, branch network. So uh, they had also said in the investor briefing that they are interested in uh, going into Congo, DRC, and also to Ethiopia, where they already have an, a representative office. So we'll wait and see for that. Uh, secondly, we've seen that banks um, and see the CBK are thinking of returning mobile cash uh, transfer charges. So um, last week, uh, K KCB's CEO Joshua Wegara had stated that um, they're in talks with the CBK to either return the full charges or discounted charges by the end of the year. Uh, because now they've noted that customers are getting more transactions uh, digitized. And um, though they don't see if charges going back to their previous levels they were uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. So in April, uh, CBK had, uh, had announced the resumption of charges to bank and mobile wallets for SACO sector. So that prompted cooperative bank to roll out discounted rates. So we're going to wait and see how that uh, pans out. Uh, one second. So moving on to the financial results, as we have stated earlier, ABSA had some very impressive uh, earnings reported. So for the earnings per share, it went up by 836.4% year on year to 1.03 from 0.11. The counter's balance sheet grew 1.6% to 398 billion, with the deposits going up by 6.1% to 263.9, with the loans and advances going to 218.9 billion, which is an 8.4% increase. So um, interesting, interestingly, interestingly enough, the investment in government securities went down by 16.2%. Uh, the shareholder funds uh, went up, as you remember, uh, they didn't pay dividends last year. So it rose to by 20.9% to 52 billion. And the retained earnings went up 48, um, to 48 billion, that's 23.6%. Looking at the net interest income, it came in at 12 billion, uh, while the net non-interest income came in at uh, 5.8 billion, which is a 6.1 percent year increase. So looking at expenditure, uh, it went up by 4.6% to 3.5 billion, though the pre-provisioning operation expenses, uh, this is expenses excluding the loan loss provisions, went down by 2.6% to 8 billion, mostly on the back of reduced staff costs. As you can recall, uh, last year they had the voluntary retirement program. So um, the, they had reported a 63.9% uh, year on year loss in low, uh, drop in loan loss provisions to 1.9 billion. As we've seen, many banks now are reducing their loan loss provisions. However, their gross non-performing loans went up by 7.8 to 18.4 billion. 
So for uh, profit after tax stood at 5.6 billion, which is an 846% year on year rise after tax adjustment on profit before tax, uh, which had come to 7.9 billion, which was 143%, 143 percent, 143.8% rise year on year. So the board, however, did not recommend an interim dividend payment for, for this, uh, this financial year. So now we noted that also because they have finished the, separate, the separation and rebranding costs, that's why you've seen there's uh, quite a difference in the costs and now they can focus on reinvesting uh, for growth. So the group had set aside about 1.6 billion shillings for digital transformation. Uh, we saw that uh, recently they launched the first in market WhatsApp banking platform named Abi. And they said they're going to continue um, with more projects like digital top ups, digital loan top ups, securities trading automation, diaspora remittances, and so forth. So these projects are supposed to, or rather, they seek to grow non funded income as well as boost the cost efficiencies. They also uh, launched an asset management arm this year. So this is also supposed to. Um, boost their non-funded income as well. So even though they haven't uh, recommended an interim dividend, we are hopeful that due to the performance, they're going to recommend a final, the first and final uh, dividend for the year, um, at the end of this financial year. So moving on to Diamond Trust Bank. Uh, so Diamond Trust reported a 22% rise in earnings per share to 8.59, uh, from 8.59 to 10.48 for this period ending 30th of June. So the balance sheet grew 10.6% to 429.6 billion, and the deposits went up by 5.2% to 313 billion, as uh, the loans grew marginally by about 1.4% to, uh, to 204 billion. Uh, borrowings were reported at 20.9 billion, this is a 22.8% year rise, mostly because in 2020, they had gotten a uh, $100 million loan from uh, development finance institutions. So they drew, the, they drew down on that one. That's why now the borrowings went up. Investment in government securities also went up by 19.7% to 158.6 billion. So looking at the top line performance, uh, it was mainly supported by net interest income, which grew 5.7% to 9.8 billion, uh, as the net interest revenue rose 5.5% uh, to 3 billion. Uh, expenses rose marginally by 3.2% to 8.3. Uh, they um, mostly because they dropped the they pre, -pre, 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 -pre provision operational expenses dropped slight, slightly by 2.5% to 6 billion. So the management has been key on focusing on reducing the operating costs, therefore uh, reducing the cost to income ratio. So the staff costs grew 2.1%, uh, though the other, operat other operating expenses fell to 3.5 billion. So the bank had earlier um, in the year announced that it's going to merge uh, 12 branches into six. This is because of uh, branches that are close to each other um, just to reduce costs and also because customers now are moving to transact on their digital platforms. So profit after tax uh, was 3.2 billion. That's a 20.1% 20 increase year on year after a tax adjustment on profit before tax of 4.9 billion. So gross uh, non-performing loans went up 26.6% to 22.2 billion. However, it had gone uh, down marginally by 3.2% uh, quarter on quarter. So uh, the board of directors also didn't uh, recommend an interim dividend as the, the group had also withheld the dividend payments in full year 2020. So we're just waiting to see how the performance will be uh, in this financial year so that we can uh, see if we can anticipate dividend payments or not. Uh, Family Bank uh, also re released its results. They reported uh, also very good uh, earnings with earning the with earnings per share going up 66% to 0 0.83 from, from 0 
The balance sheet grew 15.1% to 100 billion. Mostly this was due to increased investment in government securities um, that went up about four times to 10.5 billion. Uh, notably, loans and advances grew handsomely, 15.5% uh, to 63.4 billion, and customer deposits uh, at 76 billion, uh, which is a 14% increase year on year. Uh, net interest income uh, grew 25.3%, which is quite commendable, on, a, on the back of the growing loan book to 3.7 billion. Non interest income came in at 1.5 billion, which is an 18.2% rise. Uh, looking at uh, operating expenditure, uh, total expenditure went up by 4.6%, uh, mostly due to a 36% uh, increase, 36% uh, year on year rise in loan loss provisions. So uh, profit after tax uh, came in at 1.2 billion, which is at 83.7% year rise, um, which is uh, quite commendable. The, the gross non-performing loans went up 18.2% to 10.8 billion, with provisions hitting 4.7 billion. So uh, just a reminder that the family bank had raised about 4.42 billion against a 3 billion target uh, in its bond issuance, uh, which has a maturity of 5.5 years. So the bank is planning to use this money to expand its um, its presence across the counties, as well as it's preparing to, to go into tier one status. So it said that um, it was also considering um, an IPO proposal, that's an initial public offering, so that it can be listed on the stock exchange, but we'll uh, wait to see what management says about that. Uh, moving on to housing finance group, uh, so this is one of the laggards uh, in the banking sector. So they in actually reported an increase in the loan uh, loss per share to 1.8 from 1.54 uh, during the six month period, which is a 16.9% increase in loss. So the balance sheet uh, shrank 6.2% year on year to 53 billion, mostly due to the deposits falling 3.5% uh, to 37.8 billion. Uh, loans also contracted 7.6% to 35.3 billion. It could be that they're trying to have a more conservative risk uh, strategy because of the performance of, of the bank. So the shareholders uh, funds fell 17.3% uh, to 8.2 billion with accumulated losses widening to 2.2 billion. That's about 250% rise. Uh, net interest income uh, was reported at 919.9 million, uh, which is a decline of 6.8%, mostly due to the contracted loan book that we've seen. Uh, however, the non interest income went up by 13.8% to 325 million, uh, mostly due to an increase in foreign exchange trading income. So, uh, mostly in conclusion, the loan. The, lo the loss after tax rose by 17.1% to 346.1 million after a tax adjustment on loss after exceptional items reported at 318 million. Uh, so uh, it's gross NPLs, that's the non-performing loans. They, however, fell 21.3% to 9.4 billion. And this drop would be attributed to the group's focus on mostly the property auctions and going into private agreements with borrowers that has seen uh, loan payments um, having had, or like during this economic hardship, like people have had issues paying their loans. So they have been seeking them out, looking for private agreements. Uh, another note is that uh, they had actually received um, 1 billion uh, shillings from Britam to strengthen its capital its uh, capital adequacy uh, ratios and also to deepen its strategy to expanding into mainstream banking. They have been mostly focused on uh, real estate and mortgages. Um, however, also Britam has um, revealed plans to sell 48% of its ownership uh, to a major bank, which they haven't specified, so we're just going to wait and see. Um, moving on to Liberty Holdings. 
<clears throat> they reported uh, a lower earnings with a 45.6% drop in earnings per share to 0.47 uh, shillings. So the net insurance premiums, they dropped 5.7% to 3.2 billion with insurance premiums hitting 5.4. That's a 9.5% year decline. Um, revenue from contracts fell a bit marginally by 0.79%. On the other hand, uh, investment income went up 11.5% to 65.3 uh, million shillings. So the claims uh, and policy benefits uh, under the insurance contracts rose by about 8.9% uh, to 4.6 billion. Um, looking at uh, total earnings came in at 256 million, which is a decline of 30.9% after a tax adjustment. Uh, but actually profit before tax went up by 15.5 percent to 4.7 uh, million shillings. So it, they had uh, the parent company wanted to add, acquire more um, more stake in the company from other fund managers. So this is expected to happen maybe by next year. Um, that's what they were saying. By the finalization, to be finalized by the first quarter of 2022. Uh, so another insurance holding uh, insurance company is Jubilee, uh, which posted impressive results with 146.2% uh, growth uh, in net profit to 4.5 billion. So the uh, premiums went up to 22.2 billion, uh, which is up 9.8%. And the total income went up 21.8% to 17.9 billion shillings. Uh, the insur net insurance benefits and claims uh, went up significantly by about 42%, with the uh, expenses uh, and commissions growing just marginally by 3.8% to 3.4 billion. So for Jubilee, um, the share of results from associates, the amount of income that they gained from these um, associates went up by up 190 percent to 885 million uh, shillings. Uh, they had earlier stated that um, they had added some stake in the Bujagali power plant in Uganda. So this is what has led to the increased uh, earnings uh, from associates. So the gross profits before tax grew 119% to 5.2 billion after incurring a gain from the disposal of its subsidiary or of 2.1 billion. So this 2.1 billion was coming as proceeds for the 66% sale of its Kenya general business to Allianz. Uh, the Alliance Group. So this, um, it's expected that there are going to be subsequent tranches and it's supposed to come to about 3 billion by the end of the year. So Jubilee had uh, earlier signed an agreement to sell varying, varying stakes from about 51% to 66% in its general insurance uh, business in Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Burundi and Mauritius for a total of about uh, 10.8 billion shillings. So the group is expecting that this transaction will come to pass maybe by the close of this financial year, pending regulatory approvals. So the board of directors actually recommended a dividend payment of uh, one shilling per share. And it's supposed to be paid out uh, around 11th October uh, with the close of by the close of business uh 10th of September 2021. So moving on to the trade idea of the week, um, we are looking at a long-term hold for equity group holdings. So now it's above our target price, but we recommend a hold just to because of the performance. So the management of the company of equity rather is looking to transform its trade finance business. So it wants to make it more into a global uh, division so that it can carry out trade finance uh, products throughout its whole um, network. So it's also looking at offering derivatives in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, as well as interest rate uh, securities uh, because of the how they deal mostly in commodities. So it's supposed to help in hedging of prices. So with the, the large customer base, as well as its channels, the group is interested in uh, setting up an insurance unit 
with the possibility of uh, going offering cross-border finance. So though they didn't offer an interim dividend and last for the last two financial years, they didn't offer dividend payments because of conserving their capital. We're anticipating that now because of this mm -hmm. improved performance that they'll pay, uh, they'll pay dividends pre-pandemic pre levels. Uh, and that's the end of the investor briefing. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you very much, uh, Melody and Wesley, for the very elaborate uh, presentation today. Uh, questions have come in, and maybe I'll read them to you so that you can help tackle them. Uh, Eric Kombok is asking, August has been the best performance so far this year for the Nairobi Securities Exchange. What factors influence the performance, and what is the outlook for September? Let me tackle that one. Well, August had inter interim results coming in, so we will have a closer look in how the companies have performed and also project to where they're going. So investors had to react to that in recalib recalibrating their portfolios to align with their, with, their, with their views and projection of where the companies are going based on where they are right now. Also, another likely driver has to be the foreign investor participation on the blue chip uh, stocks uh, in line with uh, performance, developing news, and a rebalance uh, to, to movements in indices like the MSCI, that's the Morgan Stanley Capital International Index. Uh, for September, uh, maybe sector developments will be a driver uh, Developing news also on, on counter-specific news will be a driver and a continued accumulation or, or disposal of stocks in line with, with the performance that has been reported will likely drive performance in the coming month. Okay, uh, Ian Wangai is asking, uh, he's curious, what do the numbers after the names of the listed counters mean? For example, uh, E... EGADS Limited, ORD 1.5, AIMS, KCB uh, Group Limited, ORD 1.0. Wesley? <laughs> That's a really good question, and I have to come with clean. I've been so into the ticker symbols, into the performance, and I don't want to give a wrong guess. Maybe, Melody, might you have a clue on that? Um. So... I, I think that, okay, the, like the aims the, after the EGADs, that's the alternative investment segment of the, the NSC. So that's what the aims means there. And odd means the, oh, it's an ordinary share. So for the figures 1 and 1 1.25, I don't want to mislead you. I'll have to come back on that. Okay. Uh... Elvis Ayara is asking, should I buy shares on housing finance on long term? Um, so in my opinion, because we don't actively cover housing finance, as we've seen that the, the loss um, has expanded uh, quite a bit and it hasn't been doing well. So unless it can shift its uh, market strategy uh, very much from mortgage and real estate to now the other sectors that are profitable, like the SME, uh, SME banking and the retail banking sector. Um, for now, I I wouldn't be very comfortable with it. Um, it's not been performing well, so it's just a wait and see. But in the sh in the short term, right now, um, in my opinion, uh, I wouldn't advise. Okay, uh, Nel Como is asking. Homeboys look. Uh, Wait, he's asking if you can look at the admin costs for homeboys and what is happening there. I think well, this will be answered once uh, Wesley had talked about going through the financials much later on. Wesley? Yeah, we'll go through it in detail, then give a, a comprehensive view of what we see stands out. But giving a naked glance at the numbers, I see the costs are almost half. The administrative costs are almost half, so 
uh, it, it really raises the, uh, our eyes to wonder what was drivers there. But knowing that their revenues, looking at their revenues, their revenues they were down, direct, direct costs were marginally, they're almost there, though in a decline. And expenses declined a little bit. So maybe to keep up on uh, good performance, they had to cut on expenses and costs and likely administrative. But we'll look into it deep and give a more detailed review. Um, I can just okay, add on uh, that. Yes, yes, uh, uh, Melody. Oh, no, I was just saying because now schools have reopened, I think now the demand for books will go up. So we'll just wait and see how that plays into the performance of the company. Okay. Uh, Boris Morore is asking what's the outlook on Longhorn? Well, uh, we don't actively cover Longhorn. We can look into it and get back to him via email. Okay. Uh, Kamau is asking, which prospective counters have shares trading below five shillings? And then uh, outside banks, Safaricom, EABL, BAT, what are the other growth counters? Well, let me chime in a bit there. Uh, well, I'll talk of Kenjen. Kenjen, looking at their first half results, the counter reported sustained growth in net revenues that was 8.7% uh, year on year. That was driven by the Olkari 5 and the Ethiopian project, and also their, their, their EPS declined, but this was on account of a tax expense. But looking at their top line, their performance was, was quite commendable. And in line with their revenue diversification and, and the capacity expansion initiative, uh, uh, Kenjan remains a, a good stock. And also, oh, the only risk that that comes to light it's it's single buyer risk, which has KPLC tied tied to its hip. But and we know KPLC has not been performing that well. And there is a really high correlation between KPLC and Kenjen. So that remains the the risk. But looking at Ken, Kenjen as a standalone, it's a counter to add on EABL, BAT, and the likes. Okay, uh, Kimutai Sylvester is asking, Crown Paints and I&M, with, with a sharp dipping in the one-year performance, are they good buys? Um, sorry, uh, I can Oh, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, the one for what I was mentioning about schools opening, that was for Longhorn. Sorry for the confusion. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah, saw sorry, that. sorry, sorry about that. Um, so for I and them, uh, the share price has gone down mostly because of the bonus uh, share, the bonus share offer that they had given. So we'd have to look at the financials. Um, I think which have come in today, but I think that it's a good uh, buy. For in my opinion, it's a good buy um, going forward. Uh, so they've expanded into Uganda. Uh, and they've also uh, started a wealth as wealth asset management arm, and I think they've also they also introduced uh, micro um, MSME uh, funding before in 2020, and they've gotten loans from development banks to offer them. So I think their interest income is going to go up, but I'd have to look at the financials properly to give more information. But just from those few um, top level insights. I think um, long term, it could be a, a worthy stock to look at. Uh, sorry, I think you're on mute. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, Jerry Odiambo is asking uh, about any uh, the latest uh, the latest uh, rise, any information on the latest rise in price on the Kenjan counter? So uh, I can try and tackle it then uh, Wesley can assist me. Um, so they had recently stated that they got some additional carbon credits. Um, that's from using the green energy um, 
green, green energy, like the wind power and the geothermal. So this is supposed to bring in some income of around, uh, let me see. It's supposed to bring in quite an amount as well as the, the drilling in Ethiopia, it's on track. So I think also that's making uh, investors be have positive sentiments to the counter. And uh, mostly that, um, but though as, as uh, Wesley had mentioned earlier, there's also that still because K uh, KPLC is the sole uh, buyer of electricity, so because of KPLC, KPLC's performance, it's also going to be tied to Kenjan. But generally, Kenjan as a company is doing well. So there are a lot of prospects um, for it. Maybe uh, Wesley can add something, I think. No, you've put it well, it's in order. Okay, uh, I think maybe let me check. The... Grace Njuguna is asking, uh, kindly share the bidding levels for the IFB auction. Um, one second. And then while so, I, while I, yeah, yes, yes. Oh, um, so uh, we had recommended a buy for the FXD1 2010-15. Uh, between 10.1 and 10.25. Okay. Uh, uh, Kemuel Sabula is asking, what would you attribute the crazy banking sector profits to? It's <laughs> a good question. Um, so mostly from what I've seen with the few banks that have reported their results, it's mostly a, dra a dramatic cut in loan loss provisions, as well as the increase in, non, uh, in net interest income. Because now the loan restructuring window has been closed, interest like now loans are starting to go back to their normal repayment schedules. So now the interest that was suspended now is coming back into play. Uh, we've also seen that now banks have taken more into digitization, uh, equity, KCB, we've seen the large numbers of transactions that uh, happen online with more of more than 90% of transactions being done. So also fees and commissions from this also, because now as the economy is getting better, trade is starting again. So we're going to see also FX uh, income, that's foreign income, uh, trading exchange income. So I think these are some of the factors that um, we are going to see um, pushing banking sector profits. So in 2020, banks had really um, uh, protected themselves by having very high loan loss provisions. But now, as they're seeing the sectors improving, they have reduced it. So this could be some of the reasons why. OK, uh, Kevin Kakuti is asking, uh, elections have, have an effect on counters usually negatively during the election month. By speculation, what's the approximate percentage reduction you foresee as analysts for banking stocks by next August? Uh, that's a very uh, precise question. So unfortunately, right now, uh, we don't have an approximate figure of how much the stocks will go uh, down. We'll have to look at the performance of the banking sector stocks in the previous years during the election years. Then we can give you a comprehensive answer on that. OK, uh, let me check if there's one. Oh, yes. Kimutai Sylvester is asking, uh, uh, he's looking to buy into Crown Paints and i and &M, and will appreciate your insights uh, through mail. So maybe you can, you can look and share the uh, insights about i &M and Crown Paints to him. So uh, there being no other, uh, wait, there's a, okay. Willie Onyancha is asking, are you seeing the COP a cooperative bank counter touching a high of 16 shillings? Um, so in my opinion, I do see it getting to that point. Uh, we've seen, though they've been a bit conservative in their strategies, um, 
they have very good aspects or avenues for growth. We've seen that their MCOP cash, like that, that product is based on salary checkoff. So the credit risk there is quite low. And also it has a very good yield of about 8%, which is quite good. Uh, and they service mostly people from the parastatals and the public sector. And those ones, you know, more or less their earnings are, they can say more or less assured. Um, looking at the uh, kingdoms, uh, the kingdom bank, we've seen that they've gone out from the loss making territory and now are making some pretty good profits. And the management is anticipating that it will get to about 300 million shillings. So even though they don't have um, regional strategies like KCB and equity, I believe that with the, also the help of Mackenzie, we saw the project Kilele and the Soaring Eagles project. So these um, are supposed to streamline the operations and also their credit um, management policies. And we're going to see, I believe we're going to see some growth there. So with time, um, as the bank performs better, uh, I think the price is going to go up. Okay, uh, remember you can uh, execute your trading decisions uh, or uh, on our application that is called uh, Jikuze, which is available on both uh, Apple iStore Store and Google Play Store. Once you register, you can not only buy and sell shares, but also invest in our money market fund. That is the GenCap Helemara uh, money market fund. And you can also do so via SMS. And uh, we... Us uh, from Genghis Capital, we, we wish you a happy investing week. And